All right. So let's go. This is the moment where we begin. And bear with me because I do need to find my participants and ask Ms. Essence Joan to unmute. All right, there we go. Essence will be uh, describing her research on an African-American perspective of grief and bereavement in the District of Columbia, focusing on adult Washingtonian women uh, who experience the loss of their mother to death in adolescence. Essence. During adolescence, my mother and grandmother set me down for a conversation that changed my life forever. They explained that my mother was HIV positive. My mother struggled with drug addiction during her life. When she began to turn her life around, she found out that her HIV positive status had quickly transitioned to full-blown AIDS. As an adolescent, this rocked my life. My mother and I had finally begun to have a normal mother-daughter relationship, and this horrible disease was taking her away. While most adolescents think they are invincible, I was faced with the, the reality of mortality. This experience was happening at such an impressionable point in my life that deeply impacted who I was becoming and my decisions. This life experience lit a flame of curiosity inside of me. I wanted to know if there were more women or other women that experienced something similar or the same experience that I had. In my research, I seek to answer the questions. How has the experience of growing up in the District of Columbia and losing a mother to death during adolescence shaped African-American women? Given their mother's death at a formative age, what systems did they create to navigate life? By navigate, I mean, how are they going about making decisions, emotional regulation, behavioral responses, short and long-term planning? Simply put, how are they living their lives? My research aims to illuminate and find meaning in the lived experience of the loss. I hope to unearth the disadvantages that have been experienced and how resilient one has to be to overcome a traumatic experience as losing a mother. My current research findings to this point are enlightening. Most of the women interviewed discuss instances where they made bad decisions or bad choices. They believe that if they had their mothers physically present, they would have made better choices. Participants also discuss doing great things and making positive choices. They believe that they are living lives their mothers would be proud of. One participant was so adversely affected by the trauma that she experienced losing her mother that she fears intimate relationships and she fears having children. She worries about the possibility of domestic violence and questions if she'll be a good mother. This participant has a career as an educator and is in therapy working through those issues caused by her trauma. In conclusion, I hope this research will add to the gap that currently exists in African-American grief and bereavement literature. By gaining knowledge of the unique experience of each woman, the information obtained can be beneficial for those that help in the areas of death, dying, grief, and bereavement. It could assist with being culturally competent and aware to assist those experiencing grief and bereavement with knowing they are not alone in their experience. This concludes my presentation. Thank you. Joseph Troncali will be uh, sharing his work on fusing glass to vertical ceramic objects. Joseph. Thank you very much. Well, remember when you were a kid and you went into a souvenir shop and saw the little glass swans and other glass objects that were so delicate and dazzling, or you got a bag of marbles with bright inclusions, or your first grade significant other gave you or received a ring with a shiny glass ruby. Or as an adult walking past a jewelry store with the light shining on elegantly mounted jewels. I bet you remember that. My inspiration for this thesis came from those memories, from my art history class in the Bauhaus, the early 20th century German art school, and from nature, namely volcanic geodes, objects of ceramic encased crystals seen in geology classes or museums. Geodes formed by volcanic gases and lava coming together in cavities of molten rock, producing the dazzling gems within them. I wanted to achieve this effect for my ceramic creations. Simply melting glass on an object is not the issue. There are many ceramic objects with melted glass at the bottoms of bowls or cups. 
The problems I experimented with using vertical forms required overcoming gravity without fully melting the glass. So how does one defy gravity to deposit glass? Volcanoes figured this out for us. Lava erupts from the earth, gets blown out of crevices and builds vertical mass over time. Obsidian, the gem which was used in ancient times for knives and arrowheads is after all volcanic glass. Since I didn't have the luxury of manufacturing a volcano in my studio, there had to be some major workarounds. Art glass was inserted into vase openings and surface crevices were used as the part of the form that could hold glass vertically, as you can see in the objects on the slide. Follow the process with me. Temperatures had to be just right for the glass to melt, but not run. Many kiln experiments were done to determine this narrow heat range. Because glass must be heated and cooled at a specific rate, the kiln required specific temperatures, plus precise timing to allow the art glass to melt without shattering during or after firing. Glass rods would be inserted into the ceramic object and leaned against the highest point of the object. The glass had to be the correct length so that it would be long enough to cover the object, but not too long, which might freeze it to the kiln shelf. Now we have the culmination of a multi-stage process with creating, firing, glazing, and refiring a ceramic object. The result is what you see, fused glass on vertical ceramic forms. Volcanoes have nothing on me. The final product is a melding of elements that incorporate color, illusion, light, and sparkles into a single form. As with the glass swans and diamond bracelets, we are brought into a different mind space with a new twinkle in our eye. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, next up is Kathleen Palmer, who I will be ushering to the podium here. Kathleen will be presenting Pathologizing to Apologizing, how previous discriminatory policies caused lasting historical trauma to the LGBT military community. Kathleen. I will always place the mission first. I will never accept defeat. I will never quit. I will never leave a fallen comrade. This is the warrior ethos or the principles by which soldiers are instructed to live by. Since the establishment of the US Armed Forces in 1775, thousands of citizens have enlisted and therefore have adopted the warrior ethos. Unfortunately, thousands have also endured lasting physical and psychological trauma while fulfilling their civic duty. We have failed. This is how John McHugh, the former Secretary of the Army, referred to the military's handling of sexual assault among service members. According to researchers at the Veterans Health Administration, approximately 26% of females and 1.5% of males have experienced sexual trauma while on active duty. This equates to approximately 4.83 million survivors. Resulting from shortcomings in mental health care, many survivors of military sexual trauma, or MST, now meet the diagnostic criteria for PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Among the many devastating consequences of untreated PTSD are major depression, anxiety, substance abuse, chronic pain, sleep disturbances, and suicidality. Despite recent federal legislation like the Veteran Health Administration's 2005 directive mandating the availability of MST-specific counseling, survivors are still met with barriers to this vital care. Stigma, denial, avoidance, the normalization of MST, issues of confidentiality, negative career impacts, high levels of deployment-related stress, widespread sexism, a lack of consequences for perpetrators, and victim shaming and blaming are considered primary barriers. Within this discussion, it is critical to note the additional barriers to mental health care that the LGBT military community faces. In part due to their minority status, LGBT service members are at a heightened risk of experiencing sexual assault, harassment, and or stalking while on active duty. Application of the minority stress model reveals that not only are LGBT service members likely to experience military-specific trauma, such as combat, loss of comrades in arms, and within unit violence, but they are also more likely to experience trauma solely because of their sexual orientation. These inequalities include the discrimination, microaggressions, and minority stressors directly imposed by the U.S. Armed Forces. Previous discriminatory policies pertaining to enlistment eligibilities have resulted in LGBT-specific barriers to care. Most notably are Don't Ask, Don't Tell, the mandate that barred gay persons, and President Trump's Mattis Plan, which attempted to exclude transgender persons. Although Don't Ask, Don't Tell was officially overturned in 2011 by the Obama administration and the Mattis Plan was reversed by the Biden administration earlier this year, the historical trauma they inflicted is deeply entrenched within this community. 
How can the armed forces expect LGBT survivors to confide their experiences of MST to an institution that has historically pathologized homosexuality and recently fought to ban transgender persons? I will always place the mission first, that first principle of the warrior ethos. As I've explained tonight, sadly, the armed forces too places the mission first at the expense of service members' physical and mental well-being. Thank you. Our next competitor is readying himself for the podium. Please welcome Michael Califas, who will be presenting uh, the dark side of cryptocurrency, laundering money, and financing criminality. Michael. Hello. Who here tonight has ever seen the TV shows Breaking Bad or Ozark? If so, then you've seen a fictionalized version of money, money laundering in action. Traditional money laundering is a complex global phenomenon that threatens legal markets and also national security. It is estimated the annual uh, global market value of money laundering is between $800 billion to $2 trillion. To transform illicit dirty money into so-called uh, legitimate clean assets, assets, the money laundering process uses three primary stages, placement, layering, and integration. First, dirty money uh, is collected um, from the unlawful activities such as uh, drug trafficking, and then these funds are then placed into the financial system so that the funds can be changed or converted into another form of financial instrument such as another physical currency or even cryptocurrency. And basically cryptocurrency is just a digital instrument of value created by a string of computer code and mathematical methods. To conceal the illicit origin of the old funds, the new instruments are then layered by depositing them into multiple accounts at multiple locations. To complete the process and further conceal the origin of the illicit funds, the new instruments are integrated into the legal market by the creation of apparent uh, legitimate assets. And these assets can be real estate, uh, cash intensive businesses such as casinos and nightclubs, or even luxury items such as jewelry, precious metals, art, cars, and boats. These assets can be directly purchased with either with a cryptocurrency such as the popular and highly val valuable uh, Bitcoin, or by converting the cryptocurrency back into a physical currency. Either way, the purchased assets can be used to further enlisted organizations' illegal activities. Since uh, these organizations are always seeking uh, innovative ways to launder their money, they have embraced two technologies, the internet and cryptocurrencies, to do so. These two technologies allow the illegal organization to launder their dirty money quickly, easily, um, anonymously and internationally through a decentralized virtual system in a process known as crypto laundering. Crypto laundering uses the same three stages as the traditional money laundering to achieve the same goals. Although in its infancy, when compared with traditional money laundering, crypto laundering has an estimated annual global market value of over $1 billion and has caused dis disruption within lawful markets as governments and private legal entities try to deal with the threat. Thank you for being here and for watching the presentations. Next up is Joy Nugent presenting her research around primary sources in the middle school classroom. Joy. What do you remember about history class? Was it exciting, boring? Did you sleep through it? Unless you're like me and most of the other self-proclaimed history nerds, you were probably fighting to stay awake. About a year or so into teaching middle school history, I was excited and passionate about the subject material. Teaching American history, it was a dream come true. Until I started to notice my students were bored and most of what they were reading in the textbook was going over their heads especially for the ones who are reading below grade level. This was evident in their reading comprehension scores. So how could I get these kids to enjoy and understand what they were learning? I realized it was gonna take more than just me excitingly talking about history every day. These kids needed to experience it. Now, if you think about it, this shift in education has been happening for a while. We now realize that it's better for students to think and learn like scientists, mathematicians, with hands-on learning experiences. 
So why not have them read like historians? Fortunately, the National Council for Social Studies had already developed a framework for getting students to do that. How, you may ask. I'm so glad you did. This new framework places a very strong emphasis on the interpreting and analyzing of primary sources. Do you remember what those are? Okay, for those of you who did fall asleep in class, primary sources are basically the evidence of history. They can be letters, letters, articles, manuscripts, but also photographs and videos. Anything from that time period to help us to learn more about it. So I decided for my action research project to integrate primary sources into every single American history lesson I taught for about eight weeks to see if this enhanced students overall comprehension and interest of the material. The big question was, could primary sources help students to better understand what they were learning and if it could help them to be more interested. So instead of just reading about the annexation of Hawaii, we dived into a newspaper article that announced the Queen's protest of it. For the Harlem Renaissance, we listened to jazz music and we even had a poetry reading of Langston Hughes' most famous poems. For the Great Depression, we poured over letters and articles and debated if the New Deal was a success or failure. And to experience the Dust Bowl, we studied this powerful photo of the migrant mother to understand how much life had changed for the people who lived there. And history came alive. By the end of the intervention, students had improved in many areas. Their average reading and comprehension scores on the post-test had all increased. Not only that, but I discovered the critical thinking skills that they had acquired in these activities transferred over into other subject areas. They had truly learned how to read and think like historians. Instead of just reading the textbook and listening to my lecture, they debated, discussed, analyzed, and connected with the content in a meaningful way, using the primary sources as evidence to back up their claims. Their understanding of the history material was deepened because they were now a part of it. And history class will never be the same again. Thank you. Please join me in welcoming our next competitor, Ms. Courtney Downs who will be sharing her research on tularemia and its potential role in bioterrorism. Courtney. Guns, knives, grenades, bombs. What do they have in common? These are all weapons that we can see. We can protect ourselves with armor, with shields, shelters, and so on. But what about weapons that we can't see? How can we protect ourselves from biological warfare? Hood College is right next door to Fort Detrick, which houses the Army's biodefense lab, where their mission is to answer that very question. Now, I'm sure you all remember the anthrax letters that were sent back in 2001. It was scary, and it was a very good example of what can happen when a Tier 1 select agent falls into the wrong hands. Now, Tier 1 select agents are bacteria, viruses, and toxins that present the greatest risk of misuse with the potential for mass casualties or other devastating effects. For my particular study, I'm focused on another tier one select agent known as Francisella tularensis. It is a bacteria that causes tularemia or rabbit fever, thus the scary rabbit. Um, it's easily obtained from the environment. It has a very low infectious dose and tularemia has a mortality rate of up to 60% if left untreated. Therefore, it's absolutely critical that we develop a vaccine and other treatment options. Now, being a scientist is like being that kid that takes apart the toaster to learn how it works and then attempts to put it back together. To explain the method for this study, I want you to think of your car. Your car is the bacteria Francisella. Your car works, it drives great, gets you to work, gets you to school, no issues. Now we're gonna remove your spark plugs and all of a sudden your car no longer runs. Your spark plugs here are the gene of interest in Francisella. The gene is mutated and does not function properly. So the bacteria is not functioning as it should, which is good news for us because we want to identify genes that can be targeted to make our bacteria less deadly. We can then observe differences in the behavior of the mutated bacteria to the fully functional bacteria. So now when we put the spark plugs back into the car, guess what, your car works again. So we can conclude that the lack of spark plugs are the reason that your car stopped working in the first place. So when we put a functioning gene back into our bacteria, we should restore the bacteria to its original state. And we can conclude that the behavioral and physical differences observed in our mutant compared to our fully functional parent strain are caused by the mutated gene of interest. This work could lead to the identification of a potential target for the development of new antibiotics or a less deadly strain which could then be used for a vaccination. 
This is significant and highly necessary as a result of the danger associated with the potential weaponization of Francisella. Thank you so much for being here. We welcome our next competitor to the podium. Joel Beidelman will be presenting his work on psychological safe school environments, examining the association between psychological safe school environments and proficient literacy with comparison between economically impacted and non-economically impacted. Joel. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. In 1926, in White Sulphur Springs, Virginia, a sixth grader named Katherine Johnson was selected to move up to ninth grade because she demonstrated the ability to solve complex mathematic problems. She went on to be one of the greatest mathematicians at NASA and penetrated the glass ceiling for women and people of color. After failing an entrance exam at 15 years old, Albert Einstein moved into the home of Jost Wendler, a teacher, and went on to be inspired to accomplish all of his academic goals. The purpose of these two examples is to convey that middle school education years matter. They are critical. Students experience rapid change physically, cognitively, and socially. And so after being an educator in the middle school years for over two decades, I believe our ability to inspire these students during the middle school years can change their lives forever. How students respond and accept the variety of influences, both positively or negatively, may play a key role in their educational development. This study takes a closer look into the middle school years by examining the relationship between how kids perceive their psychological safety within their own school and how this perception correlates to their actual achievement. For this study, Maryland Middle Schools was used as a sample with 230 middle schools included. Charter, magnet, and specialty programs were excluded as well as populations with less than 5% economically impacted students enrolled. A majority of research and school strategies focused on curriculum. Content pathway provide more resources, but what if it wasn't the curriculum? What if it wasn't the pathway? What if more attention needed to be placed on the psychological well-being of children? What if impacting the psychological safety directly increased achievement? Trauma of adolescent children and trauma overall plays a significant role in the livelihood of all of us. And analyzing these schools that provide a high level of psychological safety is important. And it will allow us to pinpoint strategies so we can unlock students' ability and overall increase their rate of learning. This study falls under the umbrella of analytical quantitative design, specifically a correlation study, which will determine if there is an association between psychological safety and literacy achievement. We'll also disaggregate this overall achievement into economically impacted and non-economically impacted. In closing, there are over 2 million scholarly articles online on the role that economics play on education, but less than 400,000 on the impact of trauma. In summary, it is time for us to take a closer look at the mental stability of our children in schools and the role we play as educators in making the environment psychologically safe for learning. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Please join me in welcoming next competitor, Chase Burnett, talking about detection and remediation methods of insider threats. Chase. All right, good evening. What if we're always looking from the outside in, but we need to be looking from the inside out? You're probably asking yourself, what do I mean by that? Well, in cybersecurity, we're usually thinking about potential attacks from hackers with catchy names like Anonymous or Lizard Squad. And these are people that conduct hacking attempts from the outside to steal information. But what if I told you that most cyber attacks are actually perpetrated by people inside organizations. And there's a lot of, lot of different reasons why they, why they happen and who does these. A disgruntled employee who wants to do harm to an organization might commit something called sabotage. Theft of intellectual property or national defense information? Well, I think we all know who Edward Snowden is. Um, insider fraud, that's kind of like modifying, adding, deleting. It's, it's inappropriately using an organization's information for personal gains, such things as insider trading and embezzlement. 
But the most common unintentional insider threat is someone without malicious intent. Someone who accidentally causes harm or substantially increases the probability of future harm. And these are things like, let's say the email that you read, which is a phishing scheme and asks you to click on that link, or you find a USB drive stick out in the parking lot and you take it in to, to go see what's on it and plug it into your uh, network, your computer at work. These are very big uh, risks that, that affect networks for all kinds of organizations. The organization I'll be conducting my study on is a very mature network with extensive policies, procedures, and government oversight. I'll be using an online web tool to provide a baseline assessment. And this tool asks questions about how the organization does its remediation of threats. By using this web tool, assessment tool, this, by using this web-based assessment tool, we can generate an easy to use and understand assessment report. This report will identify vulnerabilities, gaps, potential consequences, and then we can target those specific gaps with remediation efforts and detection and training, things that'll support what we're trying to do. We also identify the types of characteristics of insider threats through interviews of the organizational net network team. I'll be doing that personally with them each individually. Then we will then implement a prioritized implementation plan through a cost benefit analysis. Once we execute that plan, we'll track whether or not those improvements are successful. The main point is, is statistics are now showing that insider threats are costing hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on an organization's size or things they do. And most of these are through investigations, purchasing software and ha hardware improvements, and developing insider threat programs. At the end of my research, the conclusion is, is that I wanna identify areas that any organization can focus their efforts and resources on to improve their security posture with minimal cost. And thank you. Being our next competitor, Patsy Zitkulik, who will be sharing her research on transgender people and substance use disorders. Patsy. Hello, everyone. As many of you know, the United States is experiencing a public health crisis surrounding substance use disorders. This is the range of disorders associated with the addiction to drugs such as cocaine, heroin, and opioids, among others. To help combat this crisis, it's important for us to understand the needs of populations that are more likely to experience a substance use disorder. One of these populations is transgender people. Nearly 1 million Americans currently identify as transgender. Transgender individuals are people whose gender identity is different from what is traditionally attributed to their biological sex. A 2017 study estimated that as many as 28% of the transgender population have a substance use disorder. Now, why is substance use disorder so prevalent among the transgender community? The heightened prevalence of substance use disorders in the transgender community can be explained by minority stress theory. This theory proposes that the chronic exposure to prejudice and discrimination that minorities face render minorities at a higher risk for negative health outcomes. For instance, the chronic stressor of transphobic victimization may lead transgender people to use substances to cope with this victimization. This theory was supported by multiple studies, such as a 2019 online survey where 35% of transgender participants who experienced school-related harassment or assault before using substances to deal with this mistreatment. Now, this theory would also suggest that subsets within the transgender community who experience a higher level of victimization, such as those with high visual gender nonconformity, sexual minorities, and transgender women are at a higher risk for developing substance use disorders. Now that we understand why transgender people are more at risk for substance use disorders, how can counselors better assist these clients who are more at risk? Most importantly, counselors need to make sure that transgender clients do not face transphobia during recovery. Treatment facilities should purposely create policies that protect transgender clients. This includes giving clients the right to use their chosen names, allowing transgender clients to use facilities that align with their gender identity, and including gender inclusive questions on intake forms. Another part of the problem is that many counselors are not trained in how to work with transgender clients. Less than 5% of counselors and administrators in addiction treatment programs are trained in how to provide culturally competent care to transgender populations, which may lead to unconscious biases about transgender people that may cause harm to these clients. 
culturally competent counselors will be able to better understand the needs of their clients, particularly their transgender clients, thus improving their ability to assist them in recovery. By increasing their knowledge about transgender issues and advocating for change, counselors may be able to combat the transphobia that transgender people face while getting help for these substance use disorders. Thank you all for being here. Have a good rest of your night. Welcoming our next competitor, Mohamed Sabi, will be sharing his research on botnets, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mohamed. Hello, everyone. What is botnets? Well, botnets is a scripted software applications that is designed to perform tasks that is simple, repetitive, much faster than any human being. Tasks like fetching and analyzing website data or answering your questions like Siri, Alexa, or, C or Cortana. But what is the issue with bots? Well, cyber criminals are using bots to do their malicious activities because it, bots, uh, bot traffics are easily disguised as a legit, legitimate internet traffic. Cyber criminals are using bots to commit credit card fraud, data theft, and denial of service attacks. And not only the criminal activities, but in fact, bots are being used to influence and man manipulate the public and political opinion worldwide. Several studies showed that bots are involved in up to 20% of conversations on social media regarding the elections and the political issues. The problem that cybersecurity experts are facing is that bad bots and good bots have a similar architecture, so it is not easy to differentiate between them. Multiple methods are being used to fight bad bots, and the majority of these uh, uh, methods are using behavior analysis techniques like honeypot or bot sniffers. And the uh, most promising technique supervised and unsupervised machine learning. Finally, the latest report show that the, the year 2019 witnessed an increase in bad bots traffic. This increase reached up to 24% of the entire internet traffic. Because of this increase in traffic, I decided to make a focused study on bots aiming to categorize and analyze all the available information to help guiding the future work to more effective solutions. Thank you. Well, you were able to get up and jump around. Join me in welcoming our next competitor, Susan Glover, who will be sharing her research on leadership styles, safety culture elements, and serious safety events, an empirical investigation within a healthcare system. Susan. In 2000, a hallmark publication to Air is Human revealed more than 98,000 people die annually from healthcare errors. And in 2016, the researchers at Johns Hopkins reported that over 400,000 people die from medical errors every year in the United States. Patient safety in healthcare is a societal concern. Pa there are over 36 million people in the United States that die according to the American Hospital Association. The purpose of this study is twofold. First, to determine if leadership style impacts serious safety events and if a safety culture mediates this relationship. And second, to use this information for healthcare leadership selection and development. This study will contribute to a growing body of research on effective leadership and patient safety. The primary beneficiary of this research is all those who are hospitalized. The two research questions were, one, what is the relationship between transformational, transactional, and laissez-faire leadership and serious safety events? And two, how does safety culture mediate this relationship? These questions are important and they build on previous studies in the area of high reliability, leadership, and safety culture in healthcare. The setting for this study was three hospitals in a healthcare system in the Mid-Atlantic region. Leaders with responsibilities for clinical areas participated in the study and took the MLQ leadership self-assessment. Safety culture was measured using the annual safety culture survey results from all employees. 
and serious safety events are reported by all healthcare workers in the healthcare event reporting system. Results of the study. Transactional leadership has a, had a positive effect on lower serious safety events. Transformational leadership, however, was associated with more serious safety events. And finally, the teamwork aspect of safety culture did not appear to mediate this relationship. There are two practical implications for the study findings. First, the opportunity to identify leadership behaviors necessary to reduce serious safety events. And second, the opportunity to develop these behaviors and reduce to build a high reliability organization. Research in this area is critical. Deaths and severe harm from medical errors need to be reduced worldwide. So in the words of Winston Churchill, never give up, never give up, never give up. Thank you. Our next competitor, Julia Downing, who will be sharing her research on the implications of Huawei 5G on the Five Eyes Intelligence Sharing Alliance. Julia. Thank you and welcome everyone. In a time where technology is present in every facet of our lives, now more than ever, there's an emphasis on data security, especially when it comes to safety of a nation. My research focuses on the telecommunications company Huawei and the effects that it has on the future of the Five Eyes Intelligence Sharing Alliance. I sought to answer three questions through my research. The first being, what are the concerns with Huawei establishing 5G in the member countries of the Five Eyes? What are the dangers of the Five Eyes dismantling? And lastly, do the benefits of Huawei 5G outweigh the risks? The main concerns of the Five Eyes are the security of Huawei's network and the protection of data that is collected. For the five eyes who rely heavily on their networks as a means to share information about potential national security threats, there cannot be any doubt about how the data is being stored or who has access to the data. In each of the member countries, the five eyes consent is required by the individual user for their information to be shared to a third party. Similarly, China has policies just like those nations. However, according to Article 7 of the National Intelligence Law of the People's Republic of China, it states that any organization or citizen shall support, assist, and cooperate with state intelligence work in accordance with the law and maintain the secrecy of all knowledge in state intelligence work. Now this poses a question, can the People's Republic of China disregard privacy data laws for users based out of their jurisdiction? Well, according to a study conducted by Mariko Watanabe, no one can say for certain if that is the case. With that conclusion being made, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States have banned Huawei from being established 5G in their own countries, while Canada and Great Britain have allowed Huawei in limited capacity. With two sides at odds, the future of the Five Eyes is put into question. With the creation of the Five Eyes in 1956, they have been able to stop more than 30 major acts of terrorism. In the last 20 years, the world, more specifically the United States, has seen how intelligence failures can impact their own country. From 9-11 alone, it is estimated that the attack cost the United States over $3.3 trillion. The benefits of Huawei's 5G is that it offers the most advanced 5G network at the lowest cost. Through strictly just a fiscal lens, the economic impacts of a national security breach does not even come close to that of the fiscal benefit of establishing 5G uh, network by Huawei. The Five Eyes is the oldest and most advanced intelligence sharing alliance in the world and it's vital that its partnership be, per be preserved in order to better protect the world. Thank you. In welcoming to the podium, our next competitor, Catherine Gull, who will be sharing her research on English learner engagement in the general education classroom, communities of practice. 
Catherine. Hay 44.8 millones de inmigrantes en los Estados Unidos que constituyen el 13.7% de nuestra población. Hay más de 5 millones de estudiantes de inglés matriculados en las escuelas. Investigaciones demuestran que nuestros estudiantes de inglés en las escuelas secundarias están fallando. In English, there are 44.8 million immigrants living in the United States making up 13.7% of our population. There are over 5 million English learner students enrolled in US schools. Research shows that our high school English learner students are failing. In, more than, in multiple states across the country, more than 68% of our English learner students are dropping out with an average reading level comparable to that of an eighth grade student. English learner students are more likely to drop out than any other student population we serve. Communities of practice is a social th learning theory in which people learn through participation in community with others. Wenger states that there are four critical elements, meaning learning as experience, practice, learning as doing, community, learning as belonging, and identity, learning as becoming. The high school classroom is a community of practice facilitated by the teacher. How are English learner students participating and engaging in the high school classroom or the high school community of practice? I studied high school general education teachers who were assigned to teach English learner students in their classes. I looked at the um, resources that they used, um, their perceptions of EL students, professional learning or training that they participated in, and adjustments that they made to their lessons to make sure that their EL students or English learner students were understanding what they were teaching. Preliminary data analysis highlights two initial findings. The first is that the EL students created a smaller or sub-community of practice based on they all spoke the same language within the larger classroom. And in this smaller group, um, the facilitator of this group was often the most English fluent student. And, and this student um, clarified directions and supported the, the other students in the group, um, helped them understand what they needed to do, and at times would communicate back to the, to the main classroom teacher. Um, they were the linguistic bridge from the smaller community of practice to the larger group. Uh, the second initial finding is that high school teachers really want their English learner students to self-advocate. In the education industry, we call this student agency. They want them to speak up, ask questions, um, reach out if they need help. They want them to take ownership over their learning. Um, we know that there are challenges to speaking up in a second language learning environment, but there might be something else. There may be something bigger. Um, there may be a cultural disconnect between what the teacher is wanting their EL student to do and what that English learner student is comfortable doing. Learning through meaning, practice, community, and identity are critical to academic success. My hope is this study will help educational leaders understand how to foster and support effective teacher-student relationships so that all of our learners can access the community of practice. It is critical that we support and help one of our most disadvantaged student populations access their right to an education. Debemos ayudar y enseñar todos nuestros estudiantes. Gracias search on comparison and performance evaluation of VPN technologies. Fozzie. Thank you. Have you ever wondered who's a prying on your data as you're sending an email networks or VPNs for sure? For sure. Are, are used to securely working remotely, of course, in a secure manner. It has become more and more common as more small businesses, their online activities secure and private for a variety of reasons. Um, VPNs work by creating a tunnel between endpoints. It allows for secure transmission of data packets by encrypting those packets. Now, it will terminate to also terminate the connection as soon as it detects intrusion. So, as you can see in the presentation slide, encrypted packets have visible and easy to distinguish layers, while encrypted packets are harder 
not impossible to distinguish by intrusion. That any security encryption of packets can be because of degraded performance, where transmission of packets is getting slower than normal because of the encryption process. That being said, different VPN protocols nowadays are using different methods and techniques to reduce that performance impact. My project study aims to benchmark those protocols in a comparative study and put them against each other to measure different aspects of their performance and conclude their behavior. Thank you very much for listening. Please join me now in welcoming our final round of competitors. Stay with us, folks. We have our uh, final five here coming up. Stefan Friend will be sharing his research on novel CAR T cell strategy to confront cancer. Stefan. Um, cancer, in its most basic terms, is a disease state caused by uncontrolled cell growth within one's body. Uh, to scientists, cancer is considered a progressive acquisition of cellular capabilities, otherwise known as, as the hallmarks of cancers, that leads isolated normal cells to becoming cancer cells. They may metastasize and spread to other areas throughout the body. One of the biggest problems with cancers is variability. By this, I mean that different cancer cells may all fall under one broad umbrella type of cancer, but have treatments that are vastly different. This is normally attributed to different progressive progressions through acquiring the hallmarks of cancer. Now the new kid on the block for therapeutic strategies that has been receiving a lot of attention in the cancer field is the CAR T-cell. Uh, CAR T-cell stands for chimeric antigen receptor T-cell, or in more basic terms, a T-cell whose primary receptor is chosen and genetically put into the T-cell. Generating a CAR T-cell requires taking T-cells from a patient's body modifying them to express CARs that are specific uh, to strictly cancer or tumor antigens, and then returning them to the patient's body. The CAR T cells will then travel through the body and attack cancer cells that they are exclusively specific to only. Uh, CAR T cells have shown amazing success in hematological or blunt boring cancers, essentially curing ALL or acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Currently, the big downfall to CAR T cell therapies is their limited effectiveness in solid tumor cancers, however. This limited effectiveness can be addressed by targeting two key hallmarks used by cancer, angiogenesis, aka the making of new blood vessels, and avoiding destruction by the immune system. Thus, my thesis in looking through research is to propose using a novel three-part strategy towards the treatment of cancer. It, uh, the first part is the CAR T cells that are modified to target the specific cancer you are after and to make them specific to cancer. Um, two, using an angiogenesis blocker to better allow for infiltration of CAR T cells within the chaotic tumor blood vessel network. And then three, using PD-1 antibodies to counter the immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment and allow for a stronger uh, CAR T cell response within the tumor. Um, thank you, and that's it. Thank you, Stefan. All right, it's time to welcome Elahe Eggball, our next competitor, sharing with you how COVID-19 impacted anxiety in emerging adults. Elahe. Meet 21-year-old Maya. For the past year, she's been dealing with the many impacts of COVID-19. Her work hours at a local restaurant were reduced, and then she was laid off. She ended up moving back in with her parents, which has been okay besides her trying to participate in virtual classes while her siblings are on their school meetings in the other room. She hasn't been able to hang out with friends for a few months because winter months were too cold for outdoor physical distancing. On top of all of this, she found herself scrolling social media more often, which only increased her worries. Maya's story isn't unique. COVID-19 impacted every person, regardless of age, background, or gender. Flexible work environments emerged, virtual meetings and telehealth appointments became the norm, and we all found ourselves perfecting bread recipes. However, for emerging adults ages 18 to mid-20s, already present anxieties intensified by COVID-19 may have shifted the direction of their lives. 
40 million adults are diagnosed with anxiety every year. However, it is still a commonly undiagnosed disorder. As you may suspect, the peak of anxiety disorders occurs during emerging and early adulthood. Anxiety induced by COVID-19 was unavoidable. In addition to anxiety related to the virus itself, young people in the service industry had to navigate the changes to their employment. 25% of emerging adults were unemployed in May 2020, the height of physical distancing, and indicators of poor mental health were two to six times higher in those who already experienced or anticipated employment loss. Approximately 20 million active college students in the United States had their education impacted by COVID-19, whether that was adjusting from the classroom to remote coursework or learning to study in new living arrangements. As a whole, young people adapted to their social interactions, a critical aspect of development to allow for physical distancing. Technology use increased as a result. However, higher daily social media use is associated with greater anxiety symptoms and an increased likelihood of developing an anxiety disorder. Despite the many challenges, there were bright spots. Young people who found themselves living with family may have found better support. Those who lived alone creatively navigated digital communications. Access to technology may have helped to buffer the circumstances that led to exacerbated mental health problems and in turn promoted resilience to stress. We're only scratching the surface in these three minutes. So what next? Well, for Maya and all emerging adults, we can best support them by doing our best to really understand what they've gone through as an age group that's been developmentally impacted by a historical event. Clinicians must screen these young adults for mental health disorders and provide referrals as appropriate. Policymakers must consider the long-term impact of this pandemic, specifically the way high levels of anxiety this early in life may affect this group for decades to come. The impacts of COVID-19 on the mental health of emerging adults will take time and research to be fully understood, and I have confidence that these young people will only become more resilient. Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks, his research on evaluation of cybersecurity readiness in volunteer emergency services companies. Seth. Thank you. So the first question is why volunteer emergency services companies? Emergency services is a critical infrastructure sector within the United States. And the, some of the services in that sector are provided by government agencies at the state, local, tribal, or territorial level, like police departments or 911 call centers. However, the majority of fire and emergency medical services, so EMS, fire and EMS services in the United States are provided by volunteer organizations. And the majority of the people in the United States are covered by or protected by volunteer fire and EMS organizations. So any uh, misunderstanding of the readiness of those organizations uh, leads to potentially not understanding how well prepared that entire sector is as a whole. And so the next question is, how do you assess the readiness of those organizations? Well, the first thing you have to do is choose a framework, which is a collection of best practices. And so I chose the Center for Internet Security uh, Controls version 7.1, as the, as the framework, uh, because it can be tailored to the size of the organization. And again, most volunteer fire and EMS organizations are, are small. Uh, it has a relatively limited number of controls and some framework can be huge. And it's also a prioritized list. And so you think crawl, walk, run, the, the crawl controls are first and then, and then so on. And so then the second thing that you have to decide is what method are you going to use to, to assess these companies? And I chose an online survey self-assessment. So the companies answered the questions themselves. It was a short survey, less than five minutes to take, 18 questions for non-technical users that they could answer yes, no, or, or not sure. And so what were the results? Uh, well, as, as shown in the graph, it shows the the number of companies on the left and the, the number of yes responses, range of yes responses from each of those companies on the bottom. And so what you can see is that uh, none of the 20 companies that responded, and it was a, a limited distribution test to see if this is, would work, and, and it was an effective way to assess their uh, readiness, uh, that none of the companies had fully implemented all of the controls for even the smallest organizations. And so then from that, what did we learn? Where did we go from here? Well, one question that, that 
could be addressed is whether we could even narrow the focus even more and come up with an even more limited survey that would increase the response rate. And another thing that the results suggested was that maybe it would be better to have, in some cases, for some groups of controls, their peers helping them, and then for other controls, having something more at the state level, uh, you know, helping them with other sorts of controls. Uh, so that's basically the research. Thank you very much. Final triad, please welcome Natalie Redman, who will be sharing her research on establishing treatments of a new disinfectant for use in Atlantic salmon aquaculture. Natalie. Thank you, Dr. Bolton. Hi, everybody. If you have a special place in your heart for marine creatures, like Dory, Marlin, and Crush, pictured here, then this is the presentation for you. The consumer demand for seafood cannot be met by wild catch fisheries. We are depleting populations of wild Atlantic salmon faster than they're able to naturally replenish themselves. And in the process, we're harming marine life. So what's the saving grace? Land-based aquaculture, or simply put, fish farms on land. But there is still a need for research to ensure that land-based aquaculture facilities are as efficient and productive as they possibly can be. Which brings me to my thesis research. So just like humans, fish sometimes need a little bit of help fighting nasty bugs that infect their habitat. And we're all very well aware of that right now. So I researched an alternative disinfectant or a solution that kills those nasty bugs that is just as effective and safer for use in fish tanks as compared to the tried and true disinfectants that are currently being used in the aquaculture industry. Aquaculture farms sometimes use chlorine as a disinfectant, but this can be harmful to humans, fish, and the environment if it's not used properly. So the purpose of my research was to figure out how much of a new alternative disinfectant known as parasitic acid is too much for different life stages of fish over a 24 hour period of time. So I did this by assessing a metric known as an LC50, a median lethal concentration at 50%. And I know that sounds a little technical, but don't worry, I'll do my best to explain it. So I determined the concentration of parasitic acid that resulted in 50% mortality of Atlantic salmon over a 24 hour period for a few different life stages, salmon eggs, Salmon, or salmon that had just hatched from their eggs, and salmon that were a few months old. And I found that 50% of the salmon eggs survived when they were treated with 782 milligrams per liter of parasitic acid for five minutes, while the same amount survived when they were treated with 462 milligrams per liter of parasitic acid for 10 minutes. 50% of the just hatched Atlantic salmon survived when treated with four milligrams per liter of parasitic acid, and 50% of the older, larger Atlantic salmon uh, survived when they were treated with parasitic acid at five milligrams per liter. Sorry. Um, so what is the importance of these LC50 values of parasitic acid? Well, it provides fellow Atlantic salmon aquaculture farmers a reference for when they want to use parasitic acid to disinfect their tanks that contain different life stages of Atlantic salmon. They can use these results that I produced to determine what parasitic acid treatments are safe for their fish, ultimately leading to healthier, happier fish that can make it to your plate without causing harm to your friends out in the ocean, Dory, Marlin, and Crush. Thank you for watching and remember to just keep swimming. Andrea Cordell Proper, who will be sharing her research on eFit Emotional Fitness. Andrea. Every day we hear reports about violence, crime, families ripped apart all around the world. What effect does that have? An adverse childhood experience or ACE describes a traumatic experience in a person's life occurring before the age of 18. It includes physical, emotional, sexual abuse, alcohol and drug addiction, divorce, domestic violence, incarceration, and death of a parent or caregiver. 50% of the population experience one or more ACEs. More ACEs mean more health issues like diabetes, heart disease, obesity, addiction, mental illness, and cancers. These are the leading causes of death. Coincidence? 
worse, ACEs contribute to health inequities. ACEs are transmitted across generations. So the children of parents who experience ACEs in their own childhood will likely experience more ACEs. This perpetuates inequities in health across generations. So what can be done? Knowing the huge toll financially, medically, and socially, families, especially those at great risk, are facing. Economic and educational measures won't bridge this barrier if basic needs within the home and community are not met. Enter EFIT, a psychoeducational evidence-based dynamic program created to empower people of all cultures and communities, young and old, to embrace their superpower, emotion regulation. This interactive four-week program provided children, youth, and caregivers with in-home activity kits supported by four weekly 15-minute videos to process eFit. What's that, you ask? I call it the ABCs of emotion regulation. What the participants learn is emotional intelligence, to be aware of and then regulate emotions productively. Each week, the participants gathered for a virtual session to practice the strategies in real life situations. This modeling behavior allows caregivers, siblings, and professionals to practice and reinforce their superpowers. When a person can regulate their emotions to appropriately respond to life situations, they make better choices. They can receive education, stay employed, use better coping strategies to process stress and Im improve their overall health. This also allows for the ability to read how others are feeling and appropriately react. It's like x-ray vision, but better. This reduces ACEs, improves health, saves money, and more importantly, lives. Imagine less road rage, shootings, and abuse. Imagine improved communication skills, the ability to express love, happier and healthier communities. E-Fit empowers the superhero in all of us, one regulated emotion at a time. Thank you. Please join me in welcoming Yuanadu Chow, who will be sharing her research on optogenetics and cancer immunotherapy. Yuanadu. Hi everyone, my name is Yuani Du Chow and I have found the cure for cancer. Just kidding. But my topic does focus on optogenetics and cancer immunotherapy. So cancer immunotherapy is one of the more recent forms of cancer treatment currently being used. While traditional treatments such as chemotherapy and radiation are more common, they're not without significant side effects. More recently, immunotherapy has been targeted as a hopeful alternative to these more harmful treatments. Now, optogenetics is a technique in which light is used to control cells in vivo. The term in vivo refers to studying cells in a living organism as a whole, as opposed to removing tissue from the body and studying it separately, similar to a biopsy. The benefit of this is that you can see how the treatment you're providing affects the body as a whole, alongside other systems of the body, which you don't get when you study something in a test tube. It's kind of like trying to solve a puzzle where you look at the image on the box to see how all the pieces fit together because of the colors and patterns. Or you could try and solve a puzzle by just trying to piece all the pieces together with no idea what it looks like. So seeing everything as a whole is in vivo studying. It gives us a more comprehensive view of everything. So it's really beneficial. Now, optogenetics allows us to tag genes with markers that make them sensitive to light. Once the tag is complete, the gene is responsive to light, meaning we can turn it on and off with light as our stimulus, which is absolutely amazing. The fancy term optoamino engineering simply refers to combining cancer immune therapy with optogenetics. Now this is significant because it could provide a non-invasive form of treatment. So there would be no surgical removal of a tumor. It's also more direct because we can specifically target cell populations. So unlike radiation, where you're kind of just hitting a part of the body and hoping it kills what it's supposed to kill. Now, there are two receptors in our bodies known as CTLA-4 and PD-1. Receptors are important to our bodies because it's how our bodies communicate with the environment. They respond to outside cues such as light or heat, and they can transmit or interpret those signals in a way that our bodies can understand them, which elicits some type of change. Now, CTLA-4 and PD-1 are receptors known as breaking proteins simply because they suppress the immune system. In other words, activating these receptors reduces the immune system's ability to respond to invaders such as cancer cells. We've been able to effectively target the genes that control these breaking proteins, and scientists have actually been able to test this on mice in vivo using optogenetics to turn off the genes that control and regulate these breaking proteins. 
Simply put, when you remove the brakes, the immune system is able to more aggressively target these cancer cells, and this results in a significant decrease in tumor size. In conclusion, optoimmunoengineering has the potential to specifically and deliberately turn off the genes that are responsible for upregulating breaking proteins, such as CTLA4 and PD1. This technique provides, or could provide, a more controlled method for targeting and reducing tumor growth with significantly less damage to surrounding tissue um, compared to other current treatments. Thanks so much for your time. You wanna do, thank you for rounding out our competition tonight. The two People's Choice Awards were, again, I wish I had recorded some drum roll. Oh, hold your breath. <laughs> Joy Nugent and Natalie Redman. Congratulations. This is the part that is not nearly as good as it is in person. Usually the crowd is going wild and they're walking up the aisle and they're getting their photo uh, taken. So congratulations, Joy and Natalie. And the judge's choice. This was very, very close within two points, but it still is clear. The winner is Middle School Matters, Joel Beidelman. Congratulations, Joel. Congratulations, Joy. And congratulations, Natalie. And of course, bravo to all of our competitors tonight. This takes a lot of guts, a lot of bravery. We are so hashtag hood proud of you all. Thank you for being here tonight. Have a great rest of your evening. Take care.